Attention, attention, all personnel. Incoming podcast. This is MASH Matters. Welcome to MASH Matters, the podcast celebrating the greatest television series of all time, which is a little show on CBS called MASH, uh, which starred my friend, Mr. Jeff Maxwell. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Ryan Patrick. I, I was one of the stars. I mean, there were You were the too. star. Let's face it. You were the star. Don't be so humble. Come on now. I'm not going to fight you. All right. You want that to be the truth, and that is the truth. There you go. Who cares about those other people? We don't care about them. Well, we care a little bit about them. I guess so. Yeah, I, I shouldn't say that. Should I? <laughs> Listen to this. We'll never hear from them again, will we? That's true. They'll boycott us. <laughs> But MASH was more than just the people on the screen. It was also the people behind the scenes. And that's what we're going to be talking about today because we have a very special guest. Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Well, a very good point in my book, Secrets of the MASH Mess. Uh, One day I shot a lot of pictures out at the ranch and I made it a point to shoot as many of the crew as I could because we all know what the actors look like, but we never see any of the crew who work from sunup to sundown to make our TV shows and movies. Right. They are really the unsung heroes of production, period. Yes. So we are very fortunate today to have one of those unsung heroes here, Mr. Jay King. He has an imp- a remarkably impressive list of television and movie productions, including MASH. He's going to tell us quite a story, which we'll get into in just a second. Jay King, welcome to MASH Matters. Hey, thanks, Jeff. How are you doing? Doing good. Doing good. We're very happy that you are here because you're going to uh, reveal a lot of stuff that a lot of people are very curious about, including me and Ryan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're going to a lot of stuff. How are you doing, Ryan? I'm good. I'm good. You know, what's interesting about this interview, a lot of times I know a lot about the person I'm talking to. In this case, I don't. I know that you shared a story with Jeff, and we'll get into that here shortly, but Jeff did not tell me the story. So I'm going into this interview completely blind, along with all the listeners, anxiously awaiting uh, these stories about your history behind the scenes on the show. We're glad to be on. Well, we're glad to have you on. So let me just give you a little bit of an introduction here. While Goodbye, Farewell, and In Men marked the end of a long-running series, the final episode the cast shot together was actually As Time Goes By, which featured a plot revolving around a time capsule and a dedication to the late Connie Isay, one of the show's medical advisors, who had passed away before the episode aired. This episode was deeply personal for the cast. While it allowed everyone to pay their respects to Isaiah, this also was the last time they would ever be filming together before saying a true farewell to MASH. To commemorate this event, the MASH crew decided to make an actual time capsule, and according to the Hollywood Reporter interview with the cast and crew of MASH, it was Mike Farrell who came up with the idea to create a time capsule beneath the Fox lot. The cast placed personal items of significance concerning their respective characters inside a waterproof Red Cross medical box. Farrell explained, We had a great place near the commissary. One of our crew members, Jay King, went out late at night (laughs) and dug a hole for it. (laughs) As a personal souvenir, King handed all the cast members an army shovel with personal messages along with the inscription, I really dug it. Thanks, Jay King. (laughs) Now, Jay, can you tell us, is that what really happened? Yes. uh, I was on the set, and Alan and Mike approached me and asked me if I could join them in their tent where they do their rehearsals. So I went in there, and all the actors are in there, and they said, we have a favor. And they asked me if I could dig a hole for them so they could put a time capsule in. And I said, yes. Uh, Wouldn't you want to do it? And they said, as soon as possible. I had about a week to prepare this. So I ended up trying to find a place. My father used to work for the uh, Backlot Studio Operations. And I asked him about it, what we were going to do and where we could put it. And he suggested behind the commissary. So I went to Mike and him and told them that I found the spot, but I have to ask one person. And they wanted to know, can I trust this person? And I said, yeah, it's my father. (laughs) (laughs) We picked a spot. And then um, about a week later, I think it was, I went out and showed Alan them where it was going to be. And after the studio lot pretty much closed down, I started digging this hole. And um, I got it almost about six to eight feet deep. 
<laughs> wow. And put it into a planter box, feeling that it would be there forever, you know. Yeah. So then I got back to the stage, and that's the night we all met in uh, Alan's, I think it was Alan's place, and we ended up, all the actors put stuff in the time capsule. You know, it's getting to be about 9, 10 o'clock at night, and they're drinking wine, and we're having a good celebration. And <laughs> Arlene's taking pictures, and, hmm. and so we finally get it in the box, and it had to be almost 11, 12 o'clock at night, and so now I got the box in the back of my golf cart, and we're heading down the uh, main street and it's just the actors and myself and the guards were kind of wondering what was going on and we just told them don't bother us and <laughs> leave us alone and so we headed down towards the uh, commissary and we got to a place where the plumbing shop was and out in front of the plumbing shop they had a big trench and Arlene says hey let's let's put it here pretend like we're going to put it here we'll take pictures of that but uh, then we'll go on and put it to the real spot. So, okay. Now that, that's Arlene Alda, uh, Alan's wife, right? Yes. Yeah. So we set the box in the hole. Everybody got around it. They had a bunch of red work lights to mark, you know, the hole so nobody would fall in. And <laughs> Arlene took a bunch of pictures and then we took it out and we proceeded to the spot and we stuck it in. I stuck it in the hole and then Alan says, Jay, stay in there. I stood on top of it and all the actors got around me and we took a picture. <laughs> so, somewhere in my attic, I have to dig it out and try to find that picture. But anyway, um, after we did that, they took pictures of them burying the place and then I had them with shovels. And, and then that was it. We went on back to the stage and we went our ways and that was it. And then that was had to be the day before we wrapped the show. So we ended up, we're on the show and, and Alan comes to me and after when we wrapped, he said, hey, can you come back in tomorrow morning? We have to recreate the burial because none of the pictures came out. Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. So on stage we had that we shot for the TV episode, The Hill and the Pile of Dirt were still on stage. <laughs> so Alan told all the actors to come in by 11 o'clock in the morning. And so I met Alan there on stage about 8 o'clock and Arlene was there. And, and we ended up putting the time capsule there and, we're setting, turning lights on, and Alan's lighting a set. We did this shot with all the actors, and that's what they used in Life magazine. Mm. So then I'm trying to think how many years later I find out that they turned down the back lot to make parking spaces, and they had to put a water main in. And so happens it's running right through the spot where the time capsule is. Of course. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So I ended up. Being there and, and waiting, and then finally uh, there was a driver who was using a backhoe. And I knew that she's going to hit it in a few seconds here. And, and they finally hit it, and he picks it up, and one of the guys, laborers, jump in, and they pull it out. And they all go, hey, this is the time capsule. And I said, yeah, I'll take that, and um, I'm going to give it back to Alan and him. And they said, no, he kept it. And I took off to go make a phone call, and by the time I come back, the guy was gone with it. Oh, I'm not going to mention names, but uh, end up being it. We never got it back. And well, can I, Jake? Let me interrupt you just for a second. How how many years do you remember went by before they started doing that? Oh man! So the the show was ended in 1983. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what year it might have been when you? You know what? Offhand, I don't. But it had to be six, eight, ten years, maybe. Okay, so that thing did sit in there for at least six to ten years. Yeah. And it was a known thing among the guys who were doing the, the stuff that that was down there? No, they didn't know it was. But when they hit, the driver said, hey, I'm hitting something. <laughs> One of the guys looked down, and you could see part of the box. And I said, stop. You know, and they're going, that's the mash box, because they could see it. Oh. So they pulled it out. But anyway, it ended up being the guy took it home. Mm. You know, he gave parts of it to the kids or whatever, and. I tried to get it back, and there was just no way. Huh. And then I was I was on a show years later on, and I hear the guy's last name called, and it was his son. And I walked up to him, and I asked him, hey, do you guys still have the box? And he said, well, we have parts of it, you know. And he said, do you want to buy any of it? And I said, no. <laughs> I want it back so I can return it to the actors, and we can rebury it or take it to the Smithsonian. Well, that never happened either, and that was it. And the guy passed away, and the other guy um, moved, so who knows where it is. Wow. Yeah, it was a sad thing, but still, uh, when I talked to Alan about it, he said, well, you know, it is what it is. It stayed a long time, but we thought for sure we had a, a perfect spot for it. Yeah. They had to dig that trench right there. Wow. 
Jay, do you remember what some of the items were that were put in the box? Oh, yeah. Uh, Loretta had a, a nightgown. Jamie had one of his voodoo dolls. Ha! Huh. Uh, Mike Farrell had his big shoes, tennis shoes. <laughs> what did Alan? Alan, they, they all put a, a final script and they all signed it and put that in. Hmm. Gosh, what else? Oh, Father Mulcahy had a, a little wrap that he used to wear on the show. Mm-hmm. David Augenstar, what did he put in there? Uh, he might have put some of his musical sticks that he, he does performing, you know, orchestra stuff. The baton, yeah. Yeah, and then also they, gosh, what else? Harry Morgan. A hair. Harry, uh, he put a picture of uh, Sophie, the horse. Ah, uh, <laughs> that's cute. That's yeah. sweet. Yeah, I was so bummed that I, I couldn't get that thing back. Yeah, and the guy, I, you know, I'm not mentioning names, but it just it, it's just a bummer that I couldn't get it. You know. Yeah. I wonder what garage it's sitting in right now. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. Well, the person used to live only a few blocks away, and I've gone by that house several times, but it's been torn down, and and they put some big mansion on it. So, hmm. oh my god, who knows what happened to it? Hey, it might be buried in the backyard. It could be. <laughs> I know some other people that know of him. I'm going to try to get a hold of him and see if I can still contact this guy and try to receive some of the stuff for him. Yeah. It would be fun to have some of that stuff back and maybe return it. Yeah. And then um, the first time I met Jeff, Loretta, and Jamie at the Signing Hollywood show a couple of years ago, and I, I said, hey, Loretta, do you still have your show? And she said, you know, Jay, the night I was leaving, taking all my stuff, packing it from my room, somebody went in there and grabbed her shovel and took it. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I didn't I didn't know it until I talked to her, you know, 40-some years later. Really? And so I happen to have, I have, I think, two more original, because I made extras huh. for who knows why, but I guess in case something happened, and I have them, and I had them in my garage. I think I had three extras. So I ended up. I told her, I'm going to meet you at the show. But I didn't tell her about the shovel. Hmm. And I brought the shovel with me. Oh. My brother Billy was there with us. And I presented a shovel. And she looked at that thing. And she said, where'd you get this? And I said, well, it's one of the ones I made. I made extra. And I'm going to give you one of them because you lost yours or somebody took yours. And she was like in tears. She couldn't believe it. Oh. So she had to fly home on the plane and she didn't think she could take it so <laughs> i ended up shipping it to her she called me back and she received it and that's that's wonderful what a what a great moment that you were able to have with her at least get her a new shovel <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 well we you know i keep in touch with her just to wish her happy birthdays and how you doing mm-hmm. i was hoping she'd be at the last show but she didn't make it so but yeah i saw buddy jeff there and yeah we had a good time always nice to see you and uh, you know you know, can you tell us what your official title was with MASH? Because I didn't say that. So, Well, I was the special effects coordinator. Okay. I started on the seventh season, taking it over. But the first couple of seasons before that, I helped out like season five and season six. Vern Archer was the effects guy on it. And I used to go out to the ranch with him and do the smoke pods and all that stuff and work on stage with him. And then when he passed away, my boss, Paul Wurzel, said, guess what? You're going to take it over. Mm. So I took it over in the seventh season and did it till the end. I mean, we had a lot of stuff that went on and it was, it was great. I always looked forward. We'd be off for three or four months and I'd go do movies huh. and I'd come back on the show and, and continue on. And uh, yeah, there's some other episodes stuff happened on the Jeff. I told Jeff about the helicopter. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Love to hear the story about the helicopter. And, and certainly it ended well <laughs> because yes. it might not have. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were doing the show and there's a scene where Mike Furl jumps in the helicopter and we take off. And I had to dress up like Mike because Mike didn't want to go in and do that. I had to make it look like when it got hit, it was smoking. I got in with the pilot and we we're getting ready to take off and the camera's rolling and we're kind of behind these bushes like and we start to take off and we get about 10, 15 feet in the air and it starts to miss out and the pilot puts it back down and I look at him and I say, everything okay? He says, oh yeah, we're fine. So he revs it up again and we start to take off and it does it again, sets it back down. And I'm talking to David Hawks on the radio and he says, what's going on, Jay? And I said, oh, the pilot says it's got a little problem, but he thinks we'll be okay. Third time's a charm. 
okay. So we take off and get up and we start to go and we get up and oh, about 20, 30 feet in the air, I guess, maybe, maybe more. And we're pulling away and uh, all of a sudden we lose power and just sputs and that's it. And we end up free going in with the blades turning and we hit off the road, but we were out of sight of camera around the corner when we landed on the road, but we landed halfway on the road and halfway not. Oh, no. And we're at an angle. And Pat's looking at me. He goes, you okay? Because we had seat belted in. I said, yeah. And I was just getting ready to undo my seat belt and jump out. And he holds me. He said, let's wait till the blades stop. <laughs> so we wait for just a couple of seconds. They stop. And then he says, bail. And we both jump out. And by that time, the crew's running around the corner to see what's going on. And happened to be my brother was working with Doug Stubbs, the prop master at the time. And he, Billy was there and they come running around the corner and the pot and I are out looking at each other, looking at the helicopter. And, and everybody says, you guys okay? And we said, yeah, we're okay. And uh, they came back and looked at the helicopter and everything was fine. And they got the shot that they wanted. And then it ended up being that the next day they fired the helicopter up and they looked at the blades and all it was was a little nick in the blades from the bushes. And, huh. and that was it. So Wow. The other thing is we had a fire on stage. If I told you, Jeff, about that. Stage yes, nine. A, another harrowing experience for <laughs> Jay King. <laughs> Maybe the, the most harrowing experience, actually. We're on stage. It was a hot summer day. They had all the big lights on inside this compound area on stage. And it was pretty hot. You know, up in the perms where the lighting guy was, you know, he's up there only in shorts because it was so hot up there. Anyway, on the east wall is where the wires come in a box from the bottom of the stage up to the perms to the lights. And they, it got so hot, it started burning inside the box, which continued on outside the box and was going up the wall. And I happened to be right by my set box and I could smell something. And I walked around the corner and I looked up and here's a wall on fire. So right by my set box, up by the door, I had a fire hose and I grabbed it and I'm yelling, fire, fire, you know, and Everybody's looking around and they're trying to get out of there. And I end up climbing up the ladder to the catwalks and I'm fighting this fire and pretty much getting it out. Alda Verde, luckily, was watching me and he's underneath and he's yelling at me to come down, come down, Jay. And I'm OK. You know, I'm fine. I'm fighting this fire. And then they open the big door and I look over and I could see everybody running out the door. And uh. I could see Albert with their wardrobe on the racks sliding all the wardrobe out of the stage and Everybody's running and going crazy. And Alberti said, Jay, come on back. And I, I turn around to come back and I ended up getting in the smoke. Oh. And I was disoriented. I couldn't feel where I was. And I was having a hard time breathing. And I ended up hanging on the handrail. And I knew where the ladder was. I got to the ladder and I turned around and looked. And I could see Alberti down there. And Al was saying, Take it easy, Jay. Next thing you know, I get on the ladder and then I passed out. Oh, wow. And Al caught me coming down. Oh. And he and somebody else were dragging me out of the stage. And I'm unconscious. I don't know what's going on. And as they do that, my dad's he hears about a fire on stage and he knows I'm there. So he's running over there to see what's going on. And as they're bringing me out of the stage, my dad's at a help, doesn't realize it's me. And they take me out to the middle of the parking lot. There's some grass. And they rolled me over. And my dad just about has a heart attack because it's me unconscious you know and so by that time paramedics came and they give me oxygen the next thing you know they load me up and i'm off to the hospital oh wow they had put me on oxygen i was there for a few hours and next thing you know there's the cast coming in to see me making sure i'm okay huh. yeah only took a couple of days off i was okay but uh that was another incident of mash but my goodness it seems like you should have gone on another show yeah I mean. it, 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 it <laughs> seems like mash was trying to kill you is what yeah, it sounds like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was good. all good stuff. I tell you, it was probably <laughs> the best show I ever worked on. Yeah. For as many years I did. So, yeah, it was great. To meet Jeff and Jamie and Loretta at the uh, signing made up, you know, it was a highlight. And I'll go to everyone until we don't have them anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. It was really fun to see you. It, it really was. And I, you know, I met it when I took a lot of pictures. I don't know whether you were in there or not. But I took as many pictures as I could of all the crew because I really mean that. You know, the crew is the are the unsung heroes of a production. They really are. 
And without them, nothing happens. Yeah. So it really warmed my heart to see you and uh, talk to Bill, your brother, Billy. I, you know, hopefully we, he was going to appear with you today, but couldn't. Yeah. So uh, down the road, we'll have Billy on and we'll talk about his participation in MASH as well. Our whole family was in the business. My dad started at Fox many years and then uh, got my brother, Bob, who's the oldest, and brother, Billy. Billy was a, ended up being, they both, Bob and Bill, started as craft service people. And then Bob got into special effects and brother Billy did props. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I had brother Gary and brother Terry and myself. So we all went through the business. My brother Billy's youngest son, Chris, he works at Sony Studios and he's a VP in production. Hmm. So he's doing real well. He's the only one in the family now that's in the business. But uh, we have a long history of a lot of movies that we've done. Yeah. I was in it for 42 years. I'm looking at your credits, and it is impressive. Very. I want to ask you about special effects on MASH. Yep. When people hear the word special effects nowadays, they think CGI. They think these fantastic, gigantic things. But it's not just that, it's the little things too. And so on MASH, what were some of the special effects that you were tasked with accomplishing? Well, there's a, a show called Something Depression. And what we did is we made a, a mock-up of the Washington Monument yeah. out of tongue depressors. Yes. And there's a scene where they blow it up. So I had a buddy of mine who had a number one power license and he came aboard and, and he and I went out to the ranch and we laced it with primer cord. And, <laughs> you know, we set that thing off. We had Jamie. They took a picture of Jamie with a detonator as he pushes it down. My buddy Fred and I were in the tent of the mess hall just outside of where the tongue depressor was. And we hit the button at the same time and it blew it up. And it was, I mean, Alan, after the shot, Alan walks up to me and says, that's the biggest explosion we've ever done. <laughs> it was big. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'd walk around. I'd run around all the time. I'd, sometimes I'd have my mashed extra shirt on and green pants. And I'd run around and just between shots or even during a shot with a bucket of holy bantam and charcoal. And I'd go smoke in the tents and get all the bee smokers running. So huh. anytime you saw a tent, if you see smoke going, that's me putting getting that stuff together. Yeah. And then also in the swamp where uh, they had their little, they'd make their vodka and stuff. I mm -hmm. I had a little burner that would uh, bubble up and they'd make their hooch out of it. <laughs> Did that come from personal experience or was that just something you made up? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And then also for Jeff in the, the mess tent, I'd get the uh, steam boiler going so we could have hot food. Absolutely. <laughs> Props would bring hot food in and we'd serve it and keep it warm, you know, so. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. And it, there was shows where um, I did shake in the tents and hmm. one time it was the episode called It's Cold Outside and mm -hmm. I'm outside the tents shaking the tents and have wind blowing and stuff like that or, or rain or whatever it called for. So, but yeah, we didn't have any computer generated stuff. That was. Right. Yeah. I'd be up in the, above the tent if there was an explosion. I'd drop dust down on the actors and, you know, and stuff like that. Were you in charge of, like, when uh, they would get hit with mortar rounds and there were explosions in the camp? Was that your responsibility or was that somebody else? Well, I, it was it was our crew, but I, I had Fred Kramer, who had his number one power license. So we used his power license and we did some ground hits once in a while. But, you know, we never did any bullet hits showing somebody getting hit. They didn't want to do that. They just yeah. had blood going. Or I'd be in the operating room and I'd have a pressure pot with phony blood in it, you know, and I'd have a rubber hose going to the whoever and I'd have blood shooting up and oh, that kind of stuff. Really? Yeah. That, see, and that's the little things that you don't really even consider. It's not just the big explosions. It's also, you know, making sure the blood squirts the right way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'd get it set up. I'd move the little holes we'd hide it but yet it started bleeding and sometimes it squirt up because they hit the spot and you know oh well, they'd be you know you see that and it was some good times you know and when we i knew we were going to go into the operating room i'd take a spray bottle and i'd spray it down with alcohol and the first time i did it they walked in and alan goes gosh this smells like a hospital <laughs> <laughs> said, well, it is and so he always asked me can we 
can we do that? Hmm. And I go, yeah, every time. So I had a big Hudson sprayer full of alcohol, and I'd spray all the different stuff just to wow. make it smell, you know, and it was good times. And then if they had to wash their hands, I, I had water to the sink, and I had a heater behind, so they could just turn the water on, and I had it preset to the temperature. And they could wash their hands for scrubbing and also did the uh, shower tent where I'm outside the uh, back of the tent and I had the controls of, of the temperature and they'd be in taking the shower and all they had to do is turn the water on, it would come on, but I had it preset, you know, to the temperature. Yeah. Sometimes because we had the little heaters and, you know, they'd be rehearsing and then I'd, I'd say, Ellen, you know, you got to get going here because you're going to be in cold water because they want a 55 gallon tank or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had to prep the stage where the water would be contained in the shower tent and then we'd pump it outside so, you know, it wouldn't flood the set. Were you given scripts you know, ahead of time yes. so that you could plan? So you were you were fully, you know, advised what was going to happen? Yep. They'd give me a script two or three ahead of time and I'd read them and get ready for it. And then they'd also, uh, we'd always have our meetings and I'd sit down with all the actors and they'd read their parts. And then the actors had their meeting, we'd break for lunch. And then all the department heads would get together, electricians and grips and makeup and wardrobe and all the producers and Alan and whoever was directing. And we'd go through the script page by page with David Hawks, who was the first assistant director at that time, too. Mm -hmm. And we'd mark down, you know, what day we're going to shoot, what's going to be my involvement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, as I say, a well-oiled machine. Did it ever, what you did and, and how you did it, was it different when there were different directors or was it pretty much always the same kind of routine? Pretty much always the same routine. Yeah, you know, because either I had that smoke going out the ranch or sometimes I'd, some director would say, hey, I want a little dust as the Jeep pulls in on set here. So I'd drop down some photos or whatever and, or I'd be behind a Jeep and as it comes on set, I put a little bit of dust and it would just bring in dust so it looks like it's doing something, you know. <laughs> or I'd, I'd smoke up the whole set if they wanted, depending on the lighting and stuff, because it was used also for if they had a flashlight, they're looking for something. I had to smoke in the set so you could see the light beam. Yeah, yeah. I'm fascinated by all of this behind the scenes stuff. Were there challenges unique to being on stage nine as opposed to being out at the ranch? No. Just like, pretty much the same thing. I didn't do much tent smoke on set. Uh, we did it once in a while, but not a lot. Uh, mostly wide angles and that for the uh, outside exterior stuff. And then I, if I needed wind, either have a, a small E fan with me on set or I'd have um, wind machines out, you know, when we went to the ranch and uh, do stuff like that. But it's pretty much the same thing. You know, MASH wasn't a real heavy effects show, but yet, it kept me busy and yeah you know it was like i said it was great people probably the best tv show i ever worked on i've, I've done a lot but mm -hmm. we'd have fantastic christmas parties you know <laughs> and alan yeah. was always giving us a little present you know i still have in our cabinet we have a glass pitcher that says 4077 on it and mm -hmm. cocktail glasses that go with it and you know stuff like that and then we got i got a watch with my name on it, Sporal 77, you know. And you didn't get the Maserati? I, I got the Maserati. <laughs> no, I you didn't get the Maserati? I didn't get I the swear. Maserati. But, oh, uh, you can drive mine if you want. <laughs> yeah, there was, I got another story to tell you if you have time. Absolutely. David Auden Stars had got bought a brand new BMW, and he had to take it back to the dealership for some work or a checkup or something. And so he asked me that night if I could give him a ride home. And I said, sure. I said, I'll go get my car and come around. So I come around to his little bungalow, and I have a Volkswagen, it happened to be a Baja 1962, and, and I pull up in his Volkswagen and roll the window down, and I honk the horn, and he walks out, and he looks, and he says, you think I'm going in that car? <laughs> I said, either you jump in or you have to walk home. <laughs> so he jumped in, and we took off, and I took him up to his house above Hollywood Hills there, and uh, we sat up there, and had a beer and talked about stuff. And ah. then I went home and I asked him to sit next day. I said, hey, uh, you need a ride to go back home? He said, no, I'm getting my car, Jay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like I said, all the actors were fantastic. You know? Well, you've said that. You said that you really, really enjoyed working on MASH. What, what was it that set MASH apart from some of the other shows you've worked on? 
being part of a family, you mm-hmm. know, and, and everybody was treated equal and just, you know, the actors weren't so big that they can't talk to you, you know, and they'd stop and just to chat with you what you're doing, you know, and, and everybody on the show was on it for many, many years, you know. Terry Miles was a makeup guy that I used to keep in touch with, and, you know, he lived in Manhattan Beach, and you know, I talked to Al Liberty once in a while, but, you know, we're still... It was still a very close family uh, show, and you know, produce everybody was fantastic. I'd go back and do it again if I could. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, I'm, I I keep trying to have a spinoff called Igor Cooks, but I don't know. Nobody's <laughs> you know going for it yet. Well, if you do, if you do get to put me in part of your scene, I'll be a I'll be an extra. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be a, I'll be a cook assistant. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> Jay. Are, are are you are you still in the business, or are you retired? I retired in 2016, just so I could be with my parents before they had passed on. They lived in Arizona, so I would commute back and forth anytime they needed to have an adult's apartment. My brother Billy, also who lives here in Torrance with me, we'd change off going back and staying with them for a week or so to help them to the doctor. So I was glad I did retire, but. I missed it, and I could probably still be in working, but it was better off that I retired when I did, and that was right before you know COVID and all that other stuff. So yeah, yeah, it was perfect timing, and I I did forty two years. Yeah, I mean, again, your credits are just absolutely amazing. Yeah, the last show I worked on that was working out in Santa Clarita Valley, and we started about two o'clock in the afternoon, and. It was late the time I got off. I was driving home along the freeway, and uh, I get pulled over because I used to have a Coke and some sunflowers to keep me awake. And my seats fell down, so I grabbed them to pick them up, and, and I hit the line. And there's nobody on the freeway. And I, I look up, and there's a CHP coming up with the lights on. So I better pull over one lane. They let him pass me, and he pulls over. And I'm going, wow, he's behind me, but he's still far back. So he's still coming pretty fast. So I get over again and he gets behind me right behind me and says pull over the next off ramp go what and so i pull over and they go uh how you doing i said oh, pretty good uh where you come from i said santa Cruz. i just got off work and i'm going home and they said well you've been drinking I said no and the officer says yeah how long has it been since you've had a drink and i said oh gosh probably three or four weeks ago <laughs> just don't have time and they thought are you sure and I said, yeah, I'm positive. I said, look, I'm tired. I want to get home. And so I told him, I said, look, you can yank me out of the car and do a test, whatever you want to do. I want to get going. But I can tell you right now, no, I haven't had a drink. So they said, well, we're just going to give you a warning. So, okay. So I told my wife that. And she says, that's it. Mine's always tired now. You get, you know, just too much on you. And mm-hmm. not too long after the show was over, I put in my retirement. So it was good because I got to spend time with mom and dad. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. A, a big thing that I miss them. Sure, like I said, Mash of all the shows is still the number one show, and I, I got, I liked a lot of them. And I did, but being as close as to people and actors, and that that's probably the best. Outside of Mash, what were some of the other projects that you were involved with that were really special to you? Oh, they're all special. I mean, yeah. they're all uh, good times. Um, you know. Worked on the Hunger Games with uh, some good friends of mine. You know, we had a lot of a lot of big crews, people and stuff. But uh, uh, what else? So I can remember doing Tower and Inferno is one of my first movies. Oh wow! Steve McQueen and Paul Newman. You know, I did a lot of the Rambo's. You know, the Rambo's, Rambo two, Rambo three. Yeah, Planet of the Apes. Planet of the Apes. My dad actually did the TV series, and then I told him that I was doing one of the Planet of the Apes, and he was pretty excited that I get to work on one also. Mm-hmm. You know, with the Taiwan on uh, Life of Pi, you know, was there for quite a while. And mm. So, yeah, I mean, uh, just a, a great time. Like I said, if you look up my IMDb, yeah. my brothers, they're on it. Each one of them have a different thing of what they did. Uh, we worked together, I think, let's see, one, two. I think four of us got together on one show was T2, Terminator 2. We all got to work together on special effects. 
what amazing thing. I mean, to, to grow up in a, in a show business family like that, that has such great success and such great appreciation for what you're doing. That's remarkable. And then to have that same sort of family feel to go into MASH, you know, there's a family there and you're, you were a part of a bigger family that was all about show business as well. I think that's, uh, that's a remarkable experience, Jay. I really, I really mean that. People say, yeah, they write a book, you know, of all your <laughs> stuff. And go, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd read it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and I see, according to your IMDb, that here I am talking to Jeff and Jay, both alumni of Young Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a, a fun little show, too. Yeah, I bet. Mel Brooks, work, working with him, was that a lot of fun? Oh, yeah. He's crazy but yeah it was yeah i was pretty young i was pretty young that time so you know, i was just a young kid i think i was only 21 at the time you know and yeah. uh it was all new to me you know but i had guys who i worked for and uh we did a lot of crazy stuff but it was fun you know there was no visual effects and all that it was all real you know stunts and all that stuff you know uh, aside from almost dying on stage nine <laughs> were there any other close calls in your career Oh, gosh. Man, that close call meaning uh, it was almost killed, but there was a lot of little things. But what was that one? While we were doing Romance in the Stone, there's a scene where the alligator, Michael's grabbing the alligator's tail and shaking on it on the dock side. Well, they had a real alligator, and it got away into the harbor, or in Veracruz <laughs> Harbor, and it's swimming around so the the guy said, hey, it's going to come back to the dock here, so we're waiting for it. And we end up getting a couple of ropes in the water. We're going to last through this thing, and about four of us, and then drag it up onto the dock. And one of the guys decided to jump in. We had cabled the mouth shut so it couldn't open its mouth straight up and down. And so one of the wranglers jumps in the water and grabs the alligator around the neck. Well, it ends up that the alligator takes its mouth and pulls it backwards, and it opens up the side of its mouth, oh. and it grabs a guy's hand. Now he's on the alligator, and the alligator's flipping around, and I'm yelling at the, we had a policeman right down, I'm yelling at him, he's got a rifle, I'm saying, shoot the alligator, shoot the <laughs> He didn't know what I was saying, I was trying to get his gun, so I said, forget that. I had my belt on, my tool belt, and my radio, and I drop it off. Now the alligator let go of the guy's arm, because the other guys were trying to hit it with a paddle to stop it, so Let's go to the guy, and I look at him, and he looks at me, and he's just slowly going down. Huh. And that's when I jumped in, grabbed him, brought him up on the water. Oh, wow. And they put him on the dock, and they pull me on the dock. And as they're pulling me up, I feel this thing go beside me and see all again. Oh, and they're yelling at me. They're yelling at me, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> my brothers are yelling at me, what'd you do that for? And I go, I couldn't let the guy die, you know, so... <laughs> Oh, you know, stuff like that. Some crazy stuff, but it's all good. <laughs> wow. What a bunch of amazing experiences. Yeah. But like I said, Bash, I'll tell you what, I just, I see, when I see it on TV, I have to stop and look at it for a few minutes. And I can tell within a few minutes if I worked on that one or not. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, I look at the episodes and what it is. And I kind of remember stuff, you know, and uh, some great times. Great times. And this has been a great time, Jay. Yes. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come and visit with us. And when you told me that story at that autograph show a couple of weeks ago, I, I was taken because I had never heard any of that. I didn't know that that happened. I didn't. I knew they buried something, but I didn't know the details and I didn't know what happened to it. I've heard various, you know, things over, over the years that somebody did something or Alan took it home or whatever, all that kind of stuff. But you told us the truth, <laughs> the yeah. real deal today. Yeah, I, I've always heard that story, but I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd ever talk to the guy who dug the hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Jay, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk to us. I've I've loved this. Yeah. And, and it's been very fun to hang out with you here today, Jay. Thank you again. Anytime you want to get back together, let me know. And all right. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. And uh, thank you all for listening. Until next time, here's looking up your old address. <laughs> <laughs>